first of all, I want to tell you, we're going to have some fun this morning. I want to say it's so honored. Many of you are friends. Uh, I see Ken Wise here, Ramesh Panuru, uh, Ambassador Kurt Volker, Mehdi Hassan. And, and it's great to see all of you here, and we'll have fun. Um, I've invited three members of Congress to come uh, spend some time with us. And we're kind of going to do it like a talk show in a way, or at least that's my vision of this. We have Representative Mikey Sherrill joining. I'm going to ask her up in just a moment. But the way I'm going to do this is they're going to come and they're going to hang out. We're going to talk. I'm going to go to questions. Then another congressman is going to come and then Mikey Sherrill will go off and do her next thing. And, you know, we're going to just kind of, you know, make this sort of fun and, uh, and different and not so stodgy. So I hope uh, you will get some questions and your own commentary about these complex times we're in, and we will weave that in. Again, I'm Steve Clemens. I'm editor-at-large of Semaphore, and it's a real honor to have all of you. So let me in invite up here uh, Representative Mikey Sherrill. She's representative of New Jersey, uh, joined uh, the House of Representatives in 2019, made a big impact. You know, she was a Russia policy officer. She was also uh, a, an aide of, of some sort to a fl you know, flagship officer for 10 years in the Navy, uh, and she has been basically raising various kinds of red flags on the national security front, among many other topics. We were at a dinner last night, had a fascinating exchange. I think it was all on Chatham House Rules. I can quote you, I guess, but no one else, you know, on, on China issues. But let me just start. First of all, thank you for joining us. But let me ask you, you know, as we look at Davos, this is about my 15th or 16th time in Davos. And one of the things that I have heard from a number of corporate types here who, um, you know, they buy pavilions, invest a lot, but underneath the sort of veneer, they say, how do you think we're doing, Steve, in solving the problems of the world? You know, as Davos, in sort of mocking to some degree uh, Davos's own professed statement uh, being in the world. And I'm just interested as, as an American legislator who's coming here it, at this kind of crazy time in the world, what are you trying to convey uh, to folks at this moment in this little village and what are you hoping to hear? That's a great question. Um, so my name is Mikey Sherrill. I'm a congresswoman from the 11th district of New Jersey, which is largely suburbs of New York City. Uh, many of my towns grew up along the train lines of Newark towns like, or of New York City, um, the greater metropolitan area of Newark, New Jersey, as I like to call it. Um, but uh, you know, it's it's really interesting to me. I guess what I want to convey, and this is going to sound really maybe a bit jarring to some people here, is a sense of optimism. Um, we were at the dinner we mentioned, and, and while we can't quote the statements, I think we can tell you there was not a lot of optimism. Right. Um, there, there. It was Chatham House Rules, so technically it's on the record, but you can't actually assign it to any person. Assign so. it to any no, person. It is on the record. So we yeah, can so. sort of generally yeah. tell you. Um, I think not a sense of optimism. And I would say um, also, it, you know, something that drives me a little bit insane as a, a veteran and somebody who is feels like we need to be very proactive with problems, a, a lot of admiring the problem, not a lot of solutions, mm, right? not a lot of, you know, here's the path forward. In fact, several people, as they were, as I would say, admiring the problem, were asked pointedly, well, what's the path forward? Okay, thank you, thank you. What's the path forward? What's the path forward? And, and even that did not break through to to kind of looking for these solutions. And the it was pretty remarkable. It I mean, it was very remarkable. bluntly directed. Yeah. Okay, we heard the whole problem. Like, what are you going to do about it, right? Right, so, right. Yeah. And, and then back to the problem. Um, and, and why do I feel optimistic? Um, we do have a lot of problems, but just the fact that people are sort of, when you're talking about that cynical, are we solving the world's problems, a sense that, that we haven't addressed them. Right. And a sense now that that the world is changing and the world uh, needs to have problems addressed. And I keep hearing about this peace dividend that we have lost. And yet in the United States, we were not experiencing a peace dividend. We were actually at war. We've been at war for 20 years. And the war we were fighting um, was not the type of war that actually leads to investments in modernizing our military, which for those of you not in the national security space or in the defense space, why does that matter to you? It matters because many of our technological innovations come out of our defense spending. Um, and so we weren't doing that. Just to give you a sense of what we were doing, in my district, one of the companies that um, I helped secure some funding for 
was remanufacturing probably 1960s era technology blasting caps. We had had a stock. And you helped them, them continue to survive? Because we the needed them. The 60s technology. Oh. We needed them in Afghanistan. Mm. That's where we were fighting. A, um, uh, you know, we had a lot of technological superiority, but we were mm. fighting a, a ground conflict and they needed these blasting caps and we'd run out of them because we stockpiled them in the 80s. The company had since gone out of business. We needed more blasting caps, so they had to re-engineer those and manufacture them. That was not leading to new technology. That was not leading to modernization of our force. That was not leading to a lot of innovation, as you can imagine. Um, it, what happened during the so-called peace dividend for democracy and democratic nations? Well, I had an incredibly difficult time convincing anyone that Huawei was truly a threat, that China... Um, and industrial espionage was truly a threat. I worked at a, a law firm years ago, right, you know, out of the Navy. I went back to law school. I go to this law firm, and Raytheon, one of our um, defense companies, had hired our law firm. And the members of my law firm, other members of my law firm, were appalled because Raytheon said that Chinese nationals or foreign nationals could not work on the case. Shocked and appalled. And I thought, well, this is this is crazy. This is, you know, these are these are basically our defense secrets um, that are widely wanted by other countries. Um, and so this is an area where we wouldn't have foreign nationals. So the defense peace, di you know, this peace dividend, um, we saw Russian misinformation being promulgated throughout our nation. And and I will tell you, um, we cannot get bipartisan support for addressing it in the House Armed Services Committee. Um, so I did not, I don't think in the U.S. we felt the peace dividend. So why am I optimistic mm. now? Because of all the things I just mentioned, now we have a lot of support, not just in the United States, but we're growing support across the Atlantic with our Democratic allies to address this. And so right. the way forward to me is strategic competition, well, but also pragmatic cooperation. Well, let's unpack that for a minute. So I think that at the dinner last night, since you and I got into it a little bit, we can quote ourselves, right? So, um, and and you laid out a really interesting case. I feel case. like I was right still. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a right or wrong. It was just <laughs> multiple layers of, of a challenge. And, and we were talking about Ukraine and Russia. Uh, we also talked a lot about China. But one of the dimensions was how the transatlantic relationship had been revived, how uh, uh, you know, it had new purpose or had refocused purpose, and that the... Um, Circumstance. We had we had several Ukrainian, uh, very impressive Ukrainian legislators uh, last night with us, and it was powerful to hear that and said, you know, this has brought NATO to life again and made it matter. And you made that point very eloquently and powerfully. And I said, isn't it a shame that we have to be so dependent on reactions to things as opposed to being proactive? That for years, when you look in, it's I wrote yesterday and broke a story in some of what what Bill Browder. Um, uh, was trying to do with regards to raising questions about Russia. He was paying 70 grand a year for a ticket to go in there so he wouldn't be blocked of going into where the Russian deputy prime minister was talking about what a great place, you know, Russia was to invest. And, you know, Bill would say, does it come along with corruption, scandals, and murder, you know, and, and things of this sort. And, and, and I guess the, you know, the, the question is, what, you, you just talked about the lack of consensus that still continues around Russia and its involvement uh, in U.S. elections. What do we need to do better, you know, in the U.S. from your perspective about being proactively out there when it comes to, I, I guess, sort of whole of picture assessments and strategy in responding? Because my my critique of your comment last night was, isn't it too bad we weren't more proactive on the front end rather than just being reactive and dependent on these exogenous events to get our act together? And, and you know, I've thought about this, right? Because um, I would say the, that this will make us more proactive mm. now that we've actually seen on the ground what the Russian threat looks like. Um, our NATO allies in the region, for example, Poland, are very interested. Uh, Poland's very interested in being proactive. We actually have um, the Scandinavian countries ready to join NATO. Um, and I can tell you one of our our longtime allies in the area are thrilled with that. Um, so I think I think we are ready to be proactive in our mm. thinking um, and determining 
uh, how better to deter aggression around the world and what that looks like and what, you know, what we need to do to disentangle ourselves in certain areas so we can be um, more competitive in others. Um, but again, how does it look? with our cooperation around the world um, to make sure uh, we continue to promote our economic goals and those of others. But I guess what I was thinking is, it's just, it strikes me that the, air, the term of peace, and I hate to say this because, um, it, but it strikes me that this sort of, uh, the, the time of peace in the world was quite bad for democracy. Hmm. Um, it, 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 you know, we have these open societies where we sometimes take our, our view of the world for granted and think that simply openness and transparency and always reaching out to others and expecting them the same from them, that we are going to sort of refashion the world in our image simply through this optimistic view and yet in so many areas of the world, including in the United States under the previous administration, we saw these rollbacks in our democratic values. We saw mm. this sort of um, cynicism brought to bear. And I, to the point where I was over in Ukraine um, about a week, I, I've, I've been several times and, and the, um, the first time I was there, um, it was about a week before Russia invaded. And I turned to a friend of mine who I was with, a colleague, who had um, who had been born and until he was six years old was in communist Poland and who believes in the, you know, furthest, darkest corners of his heart that the best invention that the United States has ever had was NATO, that it ensured peace, that it ended the unending cycle of war in Western Europe, that, that NATO brought nations together, democratic nations together, and ended that cycle of war that on several occasions dragged the rest of the world right. into war. And he truly believed this was the United States' best, if you will, gift to the, the globe. And yet I said- And that was him, a Ukrainian saying that? He was Polish okay. or, or born in Poland, right, right. a U.S. citizen. Um, and so he's saying that. And I said, well, what's, why don't younger people feel this way? Why are younger people not immediately sold on supporting the Ukrainian cause and democracy um, when we see them being overrun by Russia? Why the skepticism? And he said, think about it. What has U.S. global power looked like over the past 20 years? So let me let me ask you a question about that. And, and, and you know, just to play, because, you know, I want to be fair to, to all sides of, of, of these discussions. Um, my friend Kurt Volker is going to get upset at this. But, um, you know, we know from a memo, thanks to WikiLeaks in January of 2008, that Bill Burns, then ambassador to Moscow, now CIA director, wrote a thing that said, if Ukraine flirts with joining NATO, this will become a neuralgic issue for Russia. And we have to be prepared for that, essentially. And Bill Burns in a 2008 memo turned out to be right. And the question is, knowing that and sort of, and we had, as you knew, when you met President Zelensky right before the war began, tons of uh, intelligence that we knew that Russia was going to invade. And yet I'm just wondering why we didn't preposition more. Like, so I'm just, you know, with, 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 with the Bill Burns memo from long ago, you know, and if we were going to take on Russia in this sort of way in a proxy conflict, uh, do you think that the U.S. played its cards the right way? So I guess what I would say is this was never going to be the U.S. taking on Russia. This is and has to be and will be decided by the Ukrainian people. And when I went to Ukraine the week before Russia invaded, and when we spoke to President Zelensky the week before Russia invaded, and when we sat across the table from him as over 100,000 troops from Russia were massed on the border of Ukraine and said to President Zelensky, we need to talk, are you prepared? And if Russia invades, are you going to fight? He said, stop this warmongering, you're ruining my economy. Right. And so this was something that we were very much going to follow the lead of Ukraine should they want our assistance, but it was certainly not 
the desire of the U.S. to have this proxy war with Russia. That, that you know, I mean, if we wanted that, we would have done it in 2014, right? right. It, this was not our desire. However, this was something that we felt very strongly that we couldn't allow Russia to completely overrun a state that was, quite frankly, so, too much so in our So let me ask you about the democracy business um, for a minute and America's standing in that. I remember talking to Tim Geithner, uh, then our Secretary of Treasury, about, you know, he would go around the world and kind of, you know, counsel other economies on how to organize themselves to be better economies. And I said, after the 2008, 2009 financial crisis, how is it going? And, and, and he said, you know, it's kind of hard. We screwed up. And so it's harder to be the model kind of being the nanny state for a lot of other uh, economies doing this. And, and I guess I have the same question about January 6th and about what we just saw unfold with the leadership uh, in the House of Representatives. Does America have much of a leg to stand on when it comes to coaching about democracy in the world? I'm not sure America right now has the, the most focus on coaching other democracies. I think that is, um, in some cases right now, a tougher proposition. Hmm. I think what we are doing now is leading other democracies. Um, and I say that with a little bit of um, sheepishness because we are in partnership, but I will tell you that when the U.S. withdrew from NATO and our European allies under the previous administration, there was no entity, no one who stood up to take that role. And so we have Angela Merkel, who was an incredibly talented person and had been in office quite experienced, did not step in to that role. Mm. Um, others did not step into that role for various reasons of, of um, their different diplomatic relationships across Europe, uh, where we stand uh, outside the EU and, and um, how much money we spend on defense, quite frankly. But right. Nobody else stepped into the breach. Mm. And so going to NATO and going to the EU, because um, we stopped in Brussels before we went to Ukraine on that trip, there was a palpable sense of relief for two reasons. Number one, if you recall, Russia had a vision of sort of this trilateral world with spheres of influence, sort of recreating somewhat the Cold War. And Russia would have a sphere of influence. Right and the U.S. and China. And so when it came to invading Ukraine, Russia didn't want Europe involved. Putin simply wanted a bilap between the mm. U.S. and Russia, and that was a big concern, as you can imagine, for the Europeans. And they were thrilled that with our intelligence sharing, which we don't always do very well, but in this case did quite well, um, we, were, we were very tied with our European allies. And... Um, the fact, this sense of relief that the U.S. Right. was ready to engage globally again and ready to stand at the fore. Ladies and gentlemen, joining the conversation is Representative Seth Moulton, uh, Representative Massachusetts, Iraq war veteran, um, has been a great friend to Semaphore so far. We've done a couple of one good tech. Seth, join Thank us. You. And in our rules last night, we were all at a dinner last night, and uh, we're you know, going to continue this kind of like little talk show way. We've decided since it was Chatham House rules, <clears throat> we can quote each other. Okay. Uh, and, but, but, you know, and, and, you know, and, and since you were there and, and Seth, um, also made a very interesting, and I think powerful comment, I'll let you kind of make it, but you mm -hmm. basically made an interesting comment about the fact that deterrence failed mm -hmm. in a case. I'd love you to take it further and what the consequences, we've been talking about national security issues and we're here in Davos and I'm really interested in what you're hoping to convey to these assembled, you know, glitterati of, you know, global power. What are they here to, and, and, and you basically indicted everyone last night for the failure that we saw unfold with Ukraine and Russia, but take it further and tell us what your worries about the failure of deterrence in another part of the world are. It, it, sure, sure. Well, well, let me start by just thanking you for having me. Sure. And it's an honor to be up here with, with Mikey, a fellow veteran. A fellow you guys veteran agree on everything. Where, what's your biggest disagreement, you know? Uh, New Jersey, Massachusetts. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's a, that's the very part of the revolution. Yeah, <laughs> in my district, Morristown, New Jersey. Yeah, that's really where it started, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but um, so no, it's, and and uh, thank you for all being here. This is a very good looking 
audience. So when you say glitterati, I, I, I get it looking out here at this, uh, at this group. But the point I made last night is that we're all so thrilled with how well Ukraine is doing. I mean, no one imagined that Ukraine would be winning this war. You know, we used to think that, that Russia had the second best army in the world. It turns out they have the second best army in Ukraine. And thanks to our support and our cooperation with our NATO allies, we are changing the security situation in Europe in ways that we never imagined a year ago. But high on that success, it's easy to forget that before the war started, we had a massive failure of deterrence. This is a terribly tragic war with tens of thousands of people on both sides being needlessly killed. And all of that could have been avoided if deterrence had succeeded. So now you take this scenario to the Pacific where we're rightly concerned about a war with China over Taiwan, or at least started because China decides to invade Taiwan. We can't afford to let deterrence fail there or else it won't just be Ukrainian and Russian dead, it will be American dead too. So we've got to look at what went wrong leading up to the Ukraine war, not just all the things that have gone right since it started mm. to really learn lessons for the Pacific. Do you, um, I mean, you get intelligence briefings that all of us don't get. How worried are you about the China-Taiwan thing on a scale of one to 10? I'm more worried than you are. And I'm more worried because I think that, uh, not only do I think- Mikey, how worried are you? I'm as worried as Seth. I wanted to say <laughs> more worried than Seth, but I, we get the same brief. Okay. No, I mean, I, I, <clears throat> on a scale of one to 10, eight, nine. Well, let me ask you both here, you know, and, and, and I just want to uh, acknowledge that my friend Joaquin Castro showed up. We'll bring him into the talk show too. And some of you are going to go and some of you are going to stay and we'll get all of you. But um, I'm interested in the fact that some of us, and I, I tried hard to get Daryl Issa to join us today. Do you know, say, can we do our you know, proverbial Republicans and Democrats? But we, I knew you were all going to be here earlier, so it was easier to do. But sometimes if you're uh, in the media or you're in a nonprofit think tank, you get a Republican up and you get a Democrat up. That's a much less interesting divide sometimes than getting, say, AOC and Joe Manchin on stage together or getting people in different wings of the caucus. And we've just seen in the Republican Party a real serious fracture within the Republican Party about, you know, what its agenda should be, what it should care about, what it's willing to, um, you know, how far it will go to a brink. And I'm interested in the divides in the Democratic Party on these kinds of national security issues, as well as the Republican Party. How worried are you that the funding, uh, I, I guess the, the, the rate of, of running the Ukrainian budget's about $9 billion a month. We're providing a big chunk of that, much, much, much more proportionally than the Europeans. When does the um, rationale and support for what the U.S. is doing financially for Ukraine run out? both in your caucus and in the Republican caucus, Seth? Um, well, I mean, first of all, you're, you're right about the party divides. Yeah. Right. I mean, every example in profiles and cards, Ted Sorensen's, I'm sorry, John F. Kennedy's book about um, <laughs> political courage. And you're from some Massachusetts. People, some people That's got brave. that joke. <laughs> um, is, a, is an example of a senator standing up to his own party. Hmm. Right. So that's actually where it often takes political courage in Washington, standing up to, um, to your own. In this case, it's clearly the far right, the extremists like, um, you know, the, the Marjorie Taylor Greens, if that name means anything to you in the, in, in the Republican Party, who are driving this push to stop uh, supporting Ukraine, who are essentially apologists for Putin, who buy all the conspiracy theories, many of them sown by Russia itself uh, in the Western press uh, about, um, about why we shouldn't be supporting Ukraine. And, and they're not going to succeed They've already succeeded in getting the ear of McCarthy. They've already succeeded in getting some promises from McCarthy. But ultimately, McCarthy is going to be in a negotiation uh, with the Senate and the White House. And, and he's not going to win and get zero aid for Ukraine. But, but, <clears throat> but, let's say, uh, but let's say the Senate comes in at 120 and the White House comes in at 100 and McCarthy's at zero. You know, we're not going to get 110. Right. It's a compromise. Like it's going to come down. 
So, so the concern is right. not that, that we cut it off, um, but that, that we're not going to be supporting Ukraine as much as, as we should be. Mikey, how do you see it? And as you answer that, is there any chance that Kevin McCarthy becomes the Democrat speaker at some particular moment? You know, in, if, if, if there's a vote to vacate the chair, do the Democrats save him? You know, I think, um, and I've, we were talking about this with people even during the speaker vote, um, it's not suddenly that Democrats see a champion in Kevin McCarthy and decide amongst ourselves, gosh, that's our guy, right? <laughs> um, and uh, I think what it would take would certainly be some, some conversations and outreach and an understanding of where the moderate wing of the Republican Party is and would the, would the moderate wing uh, be good partners. Kevin McCarthy himself um, is, is not always seen as um, the most trustworthy of partners. However, I think with the moderate wing, and we both um, have quite a few friends across the aisle that we deal with all the time, and, and should some of them you know, come forward and say, look, here's the deal. Right. This is, for example, how we get the debt ceiling lifted. Are you in or out? And, um, you know, then I think there's a good chance that happens. And I, I'm, I'm very much hoping that happens because mm -hmm. my sense is the American people have been pushing us towards moderation and pushing us towards bipartisanship. And, and I say that because we see these ever decreasing majorities in the House of Representatives. We see these tight, tight margins in the Senate, 50-50 in the last Senate. And so America is sort of saying, hey, you know, balance yourselves out. Stop, stop being extremist parties. And yet what that has done so far in the House with speakers who do not want to reach across the aisle. And, and I would say for all of her gifts, Nancy Pelosi was not somebody that wanted to pass legislation with Republicans. She very much wanted mm -hmm. to do that within the Democratic caucus. And you didn't like that, right? No, I, yeah. I feel we missed some opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. Now, it's hard to, to argue with success in getting some of what we got done through very tight majorities. However, I do think there are some missed opportunities in, in certain areas. Um, I, what these tight majorities have done with speakers who are not willing to reach across the aisle, and certainly Kevin McCarthy ha did not do that right. in his speaker vote, is give inordinate power to the extremes of the party right. as, as the country's pushing for moderation. Well, let's welcome also to our show Representative Joaquin Castro of Texas. So thank you very much, Joaquin, for joining us. Um, and as he's coming up, I want to ask Seth something. Seth, you've been looking at AI in the battlefield, and I was at a forum recently um, in Slovakia, and, and there's a gentleman there for the Munich Security Conference sort of talking about that Ukrainians are doing something extraordinary uh, not just with AI, but just basically synthesizing intelligence, you know, credit card data, iPhone, you know, phone data, stuff that intelligence they're getting from us and there, and creating real-time intelligence and, and synthesizing it in ways that no power's done before. Like, it's a pretty cosmic thing. And you're, you know, both fascinated by this and concerned about, as you bring in new tools, AI tools, what do we need to be thinking about, by the way, of, of new dimensions in warfare, and how do you think the U.S. has to be prepared in, in, that, in that space? Well, well, first of all, we need to catch up because I would love to say that it was- uh, So you're, you know, you're saying we are behind then? Absolutely, we're way behind. You know, I'd love to say that it was geniuses in our Department of that's Defense. That's in a forum, I say that's a tweetable moment in case any of you are wondering. So, you know, <laughs> so. <laughs> I would love to say that it was our geniuses in the Department of Defense who taught the Ukrainians how to do this. You know, who said you ought to have a, pr a program for your civilians to be finding the names of Russian soldiers and tracing them back right. to their parents and calling them at home, which is kind of brilliant. Mm -hmm. But they did that on their own. Right. We're watching and learning. You know, we're the ones who, uh, as soon as we wanted to reinforce Eastern Europe, we sent a bunch of tanks to Poland. We sent a bunch of tanks to Poland when the Ukrainians are showing how you use drones that cost a few thousand dollars to blow up tanks at the rapid rate mm -hmm. on the ground in, in Ukraine. So, so we are way behind and we've, we've got to catch up with the rest of the world. China is investing in this. Russia is paying attention. Ukraine is showing us how it's done. In uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan, you saw um, drones 
right. uh, exact mass of casualties on the battlefield. A lot of people miss that moment, but it was a real seminal pivot moment in in how and how modern wars are fought so the first thing we have to do is catch up and it was it, turkish drones that were helpful but one quick little add-on both of you and i'm going to jump to, to this guy is 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 turkey a good solvent uh partner in nato well that's a, that's a loaded question but let me <laughs> at the risk of avoiding that question let me make one other point which is really important about ai is that, is that you know coming out of world war ii we had unleashed this massive new power uh, against the world, right. nuclear weapons. But there was a massive effort to meet that new challenge to set the rules of the road for how it's used, for how nuclear weapons are used. And that, that legacy from 1945, many of it enacted by the scientists who developed these weapons themselves, has ensured that nuclear weapons have not been used since. Mm. There is nothing like that going on right now with artificial intelligence, with AI-enabled weapons. And if we do not get ahead of this and set the standards, the new Geneva Conventions for the use of AI, China will establish those standards themselves. Mm. And let me tell you, they're not going to be our standards. Right. They don't care about civilian casualties. They don't care about collateral damage the way we do. So if they set the standards, then we are going to be at a disadvantage. And not only will a lot of innocent people die, but we will start losing war. So that's the implication right. here. Real, why it's so dangerous. Real quick, States. Mikey, on Turkey. Sure. Um... And, and I'll just piggyback off what Seth said as well, is the U.S. withdrawal from um, global affairs, it, it really damages our ability to set the rules of the road in so many ways that have been advantageous to um, economies like ours, like our democratic friends, and I think, um, and dangerous, as Seth has pointed out. Um, we also, as far as Turkey, Turkey's a necessary ally in NATO. Uh, that's the byline, necessary <laughs> bumper sticker, necessary, yes, necessary ally. Um, you know, you, you can't always choose your family, right? And, and we're all family now in NATO, and we have made some good progress towards, um, uh, when I was just in Scandinavia, our, our new, um, soon-to-be new NATO allies feel mm. confident and comfortable with their relationship right now with Turkey. There were some speed bumps. Um, so the, the Finland, Sweden, Turkey deal is all done? Um, no, it's not done, um, but it seemed people seem to feel comfortable with the path that it is on. Um, I believe Turkey has some elections this spring yeah. and, and hopefully moving forward from there. But, but, every, yeah. but we do seem to, to be in a good place for now. Um, and then right. um, I just, though, I am going to tap out now that my yes great friends are great well here thank you to, to well that, thank big you. big round of applause for mikey sherrill thank representative of new jersey you. great to see you thank you for coming um why don't you come over and join us right over here on the you know my couch here um joaquin and and let me just you know ask you when i opened the the forum um with with mikey i asked her you know in this place and i i think in our morning Davos dispatch today, Ben Smith had a great little visual chart in which he showed the number of American speakers were so gargantuan compared to any others that are out there. And I'm just wondering if the American story here is that great to tell. Like, you know, are, are we, are, you know, if you think about, you've, you've been very critical, for instance, of Joe Biden and the Biden White House on immigration. And you know, a lot of the issues the America is facing have transnational dimension, have international uh, hooks um, that matter. And, and I do want to ask you about where you're thinking about immigration and what the Biden administration is getting wrong in terms of America's place in the world and America's own DNA about asylum, et cetera. Sure. But, but I think the other part of it is, as we're telling, as Americans are telling this story in Davos, do we have standing as much as we used to? Uh, I think so. Well, first of all, I want to say to Justin and Steve and Ben and everybody, congratulations on the creation <laughs> of Semaphore and everything that y'all are undertaking. And thank you for inviting me and Mikey and Seth to be here to discuss these mm. things. Um, the answer is yes. The Amer America is back on the world stage. Uh, and as you mentioned, you can see that from the mm. presence of Americans here speaking on all these issues. Uh, uh, Mikey made the comment that... Uh, but we don't America have like a promenade place. Like, you know, <laughs> India has something and, you know... We could pull out an American a, a flag district. here. I met the governor of one of these big districts in India. It has huge place, like like thousands of people. We, you know, there's, there's no U.S. pavilion that I see. Is there? I miss it. Maybe it's self. We'll get we'll get Semaphore, know. Politico, yeah. and a few okay. others okay. to underwrite. Axios. Okay. Axios. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, yeah, I think Joe Bi Joe Biden has made an effort to bring America back as a leader among nations on so many issues, 
as a North Star. Right. Uh, so, for example, over the last several years, American democracy had been criticized, heavily criticized, uh, most especially two years ago when we experienced January 6th. Seth and I were both in the Capitol complex uh, when that happened. And so there was a question about the direction of American democracy. But I, over the last few years, uh, I've been very heartened by the fact that we were able to, as Democrats, we were able to break through a lot of the gridlock that had really boggled down uh, major legislation in Washington for years. So when you think about what we did on infrastructure, the, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, other pieces of legislation that were major pieces of legislation, uh, that's significant. And also a president that helped us rebound from the pandemic. Uh, you talk about America's role in the world. American companies were leading in helping the world through the, through vaccines bounce back from the pandemic. So I absolutely think that America is a leader among nations. Uh, now, in terms of specific disagreements with the president, yeah, I think all of us as Democrats, I don't think any of us agrees with Joe Biden 100 uh, percent. I think if you picked an issue, there would be disagreement. Um, with How much president. percentage do you agree with Joe Biden? Oh, I don't know. You got to have to look at my voting <laughs> record. <laughs> on it. But on immigration, for example, yeah, I mean, the issue that I've taken, because I've spent a lot of time working on that issue over the years, I'm in my sixth term in Congress, right. uh, is on what's going on with the use of Title 42. Uh, for those of you, I, I know there's Americans here, but those of you that are not American, Title 42 uh, is a policy that allows people to be automatically expelled without the normal processes of asylum. Well, it's a health waiver. That's right. Under, under the idea that it's, there's a health emergency. So as there's no longer a declared health emergency, but Title 42 is still in place to expel people before allowing them to go through the asylum process, so they basically have to wait somewhere else, what I have said is that we're fundamentally changing what America stands for as a nation where throughout the generations, people from all over the world have sought asylum. And that that, that to me is going to set a new standard for not only uh, Republicans, because it was Donald Trump that put that policy in place through Stephen Miller, but also Democratic presidents. Uh, I don't see a Democratic president after this uh, if Title 42 stays in place through the remainder but, of the Biden administration. Coming back, I, to I don't want to go this down this rabbit hole too much, but isn't yeah. the problem also? <clears throat> I know a lot of progressives who you know who written on this issue and said, "Look, that's part of the equation. The other equation is the." Uh, embarrassing lack of resources in the court system to process asylum cases. There's a five-year backlog. So you've got hundreds of thousands of cases, you know, pending and that the system can't take on more. So the, the criticism that I think, you know, some um, uh, who, whether it's Title 42 or whatever, said you, you, you were facing a tsunami of more cases. How do you deal with that? That doesn't come up in discussion much. You know, why don't we hire a lot more lawyers or judges or justices or expedite the cases that are pending now? No, that's a great question. You're right. We do have a backlog. And people, you go pre-pandemic, people were waiting years for these cases to be heard in court. Mm. Uh, and so the fundamental problem we have in Congress is that we have not passed a comprehensive immigration reform bill. We got close in 2013 when the Senate, in a bipartisan way, with 68 votes, passed an immigration reform bill. But Speaker Boehner... Uh, even though it looked like it had the votes, probably about 228 votes or so, somewhere around there, didn't put the bill on the floor for a vote, mm -hmm. right, because of the Haster rule and so forth. Uh, so that was, an op that was a real missed opportunity. And, and since then, we've been trying to work our way back. But with Donald Trump, the politics of immigration, as you all know, right. have changed a lot. Yeah. S Seth, let me ask you a question. Sort of may I may not get this out right. I'm trying to put it. You know, we're in the blockchain hub now. Casper Labs is, is, is hosting us here for this conversation today. And it's kind of like part of science, part of the next platform going out there. And, and one of the things I've written about over the years is how science as an avocation and as a focus of government has risen and fallen. We've had with the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, oddly named for being a science investment, but it had new investment in the CHIPS Act, investment in science. And I, at the dinner last night, you were there, I'll quote myself again. Um, you know, I said, it's interesting if you look at the major technological advancements that are abounding in every area, it's staggering. But yet if Galileo was alive today, he'd still be found guilty. How is that tension <clears throat> going with your constituents? And do they believe in the U.S. government working with Europe to, to move forward in this? Or do they look at it as corporate welfare, as more of a takeaway that's somehow leaving people behind? You know, I'm just interested in science's really bad marketing skills with people. Well, I think science, science resonates in Massachusetts. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a lot of universities. We understand how important science is to the economy. We're responsible for 
uh, very proudly the home of you know Moderna that developed one of the COVID vaccines. We're responsible for a lot of the innovations that um, that that pers- you know that that go throughout the world today. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think it's a problem with my constituents, but <clears throat> there's no <clears throat> there's no question that it's an issue um, in in Congress, and it's an issue with um, with many parts of. Uh, of, of the country and in, in, in parts of, um, you know, Republican Party especially. Mm. But when, you know, I, I think the challenge for, for, for all of us is to show America that this doesn't have to be a politically divisive issue. Right. And, and, and that's going to take some work. But I co-chaired the Future Defense Task Force where we looked at where we need to be 30 years from now, um, including on things like AI. Which is, you know, which is why I know that we're, we're way behind. But the Republicans on that panel essentially came in saying, with respect to science, stop all this government funding, this government subsidized research, and just recognize that the, corporate, the, the, the private sector is setting the pace. The private sector is leading the way. We just need to adopt private sector technologies. Democrats came in much more defensive of the the traditional scientific aid that goes to basic research at our universities. And the unmistakable bipartisan conclusion of this panel was that we need to do both. That yes, Department of Defense needs to recognize that, you know, Apple has much more advanced devices than many of things that are still in our planes and Humvees. And we ought to be able to adopt that technology more quickly. But Apple wouldn't have ever developed the iPhone if it couldn't rely on the basic, extremely risky scientific research that universities undertake because it's too risky for the, for the corporate sector. So we have to continue to do both. Let me, let me ask you one, one out of left. I can't help it. You signed a letter basically saying George Sant, um, Santos should not uh, be seated in a committee because he'll get national security uh, information and, and it would be leaked out. What, you know, what, what can you tell us about the, the, the Santos situation that those of us here don't know? <laughs> Well, George, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean it's, it's, it's an embarrassment that he's a colleague. Um, I, I mean, if you were here, and, and there's bipartisan agreement largely. There is. I mean, I mean, many yeah, of yeah. Republicans asked Republicans him to in New York have yeah. asked him to step right. down, with the notable right. exception of Elise Stefanik, who's in leadership. But um, I mean, if he were here this morning, Steve, I wouldn't trust him to take out the trash. Mm. How on earth are you going to trust him? to sit down with classified intelligence on one of our committees. The Democratic Party, and, you know, I know Robert Zimmerman who ran against it, but did the party invest nothing in this race? Political malpractice is what it says. Uh, And I don't think Democrats have been candid enough about this. About their own malpractice. Absolute political malpractice to rely on the New York Times after the fact, after the election, to figure out what our opposition research should have figured out two years ago. Yeah, that that was bizarre that none of that was... um... None That's a much more polite way to put it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that was bizarre. That, that none of, yeah, that none of it would come out before the election. And apparently some Republicans knew of the fraud and didn't say anything. I mean, that's not a surprise that they didn't say anything once he was their candidate, right? Um, I mean, this I guess, guy's a fugitive in Brazil. Yeah. You're going to trust him? I mean, wh- wh- why wouldn't he just go sell secrets to Brazil? When he's already sell secrets. He's already sold lies to his his constituents. Why wouldn't he do that? Now there's this reporting about connections to Russia and so forth, uh, so oh. that's problematic. But but I suspect that if he continues in Congress, I would think that he gets indicted uh, during those two years. That's my prediction. Let me ask you both one last question, and then I'm going to go to our audience. Um, in 2016, when it was clear that Donald Trump was going to be running against Hillary Clinton and not Joe Biden. Um, Joe Biden gave me an interview, it was an on-the-record interview, and uh, he said the problem with the Democratic Party, was very bold, said is was a party of snobs. And, and, and in a way, if you look at the origins and the strength and the turbocharged nature of Donald Trump's campaign, was doing, he somehow resonated with people who felt demeaned, left behind, um, uh, and, 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 and basically looked down on by essentially a, a, a different establishment, whether it was both part of the Republican Party but, but the Democrats, and that's what Joe Biden was telling me. Have the Democrats fixed that problem? Well, I, I guess, Steve, let me take issue with that because... I mean, that's what he said. Sure, it's yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. Well, because I represent a district in San Antonio, Texas, that is about 70% mostly Mexican-American, and it is extremely working class. Right. I mean, you know, until a few years ago when housing prices in San Antonio really started to rise because of speculation... You would find houses in my district that were worth $30,000, okay, shacks, literally in my district, 
worth $30,000 up to a million dollars, right? In Texas, you know, the prices of real estate are a lot cheaper than in Los Angeles or New York, for example. So these are people uh, who literally every day, many of them are getting up in the morning, taking public transportation to work, and then coming home on public transportation to their families. And these are folks who have been solidly democratic for generations. So whenever I hear people think or, or make the comment that, that working class people um, you know, are no longer aligned with the Democratic Party or the Republican Party has something more to offer them, I, I just don't see that where I'm from. Mm. Uh, I don't see it in my hometown of San Antonio and many places like it. Mm. Seth? Uh, I'm going to agree with the president on this and uh, disagree a little bit with my colleague. Um, sure, I can look at my district and I can point to election results and I can talk about a lot of constituents who exist across the political, economic, racial spectrum who vote right. Democratic, and I'm proud of that. But I do think our party is at risk of becoming the party of the 10% who have very little and the 5% who have everything. Mm. And then the 85% in between are very much at risk of going the other way. Right. And one of the questions I sometimes get is, you know, Seth, you have this job where you go and, you know, sit on panels with Joaquin Castro with Davos. Mm. How do you stay grounded? And one of the ways that I stay grounded is I stay in touch with the Marines I served with. Right. From all over this country. Some of them extremely successful right now. Some of them struggling. Many of them dealing with post-traumatic stress. Many of them facing a future where the best thing they did in their lives was in Iraq 10 years ago. And staying in touch with them, I think, is something that, that our party needs to do a better job of. Oh, fascinating. I promised Ramesh Panuru if he wants the first question. He's National Review, great writer. But, so Ramesh first. And let's get you a microphone if we can. Thanks. Um, oh, yeah. When I think about what is going to happen in this next Congress, um, uh, it seems to me that the first, second, and third issue is the debt limit. Right. Uh, does it get raised? Under what circumstances? Um, when? Right. Uh, am I wrong to think that that is far more important than almost anything else that we're talking about in terms of policy accomplishments by this Congress? And second, how hopeful are you or what do you think the prospects are? And, and as you answer that, can you tell us what the fourth, fifth, and sixth priorities are? Yeah. <laughs> well, as you know, I mean, there has been a lot of speculation about how Speaker McCarthy and Republicans will handle the debt ceiling. And it is, as you described, the reason it's so important and is perhaps number one on the agenda is because it could become a crisis for the United States, gov the United States government. Um, and so you know, here's my take kind of historically. I'm in my sixth term now in Congress. And I saw John Boehner and Paul Ryan struggle with the Republican conference on this. But ultimately, I think the Republican speakers got caught between being a responsible partner in government and catering to the very right flank of the Republican Party. Um, and ultimately, with Democratic votes, we raise the debt ceiling, right? Uh, the question now is, will, will Kevin McCarthy do the same thing and ultimately be responsible as Boehner and the others were? Uh, or will he give in to that right flank? That's why the fight over the rules matters where one person can make a motion to vacate uh, the chair and all of a sudden the speakership is in jeopardy. Uh, that's why it was such a big deal for things like this. Mm -hmm. In fact, exactly for this. Um, so there are different scenarios that could happen. He could do what John Boehner and Paul Ryan did before and say, I'm going to put it up for a vote and Democrats are going to carry it for me, basically. Um, and then they're all mad at him and so forth. Uh, but, or you could do a discharge petition, right? Where you get a majority of members of Congress, mostly Democrats and some Republicans who want to be fiscally that's responsible. That's what Brian Fitzpatrick's trying to do. Right. And so that could happen. And that, if it happened that way, it would be essentially with a wink and a nod by Kevin McCarthy that, hey, I'm going to, I'm not going to be for this, but yeah, go ahead and, you know, you go ahead and do it with the Democrats. So I can't tell you, of course, exactly how it's going to go down. Um, and, you know, and it wouldn't surprise me if, if Republicans take us to a place in the House where we do go, where the government shuts down for a period of time. I, my first year in 2013 was the Ted Cruz shutdown, so to speak, uh, for almost two weeks, I think. I'm right. trying to remember the days. But, but yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if, if there's some statement shutdown that is made for a period of time. I mean, uh, I'll just say, look at, look at the speaker fight. Right. Yeah. It'll very well go the same way, where it's chaotic, it's messy, 
it's embarrassing. But at the end of the day, we, we, we have a solution that no one really loves, but we can live with. Look, I, you know, I'm going to go right here in the front and then to Ken Weinstein um, right here in the front. What I want to say is when uh, the last time around on this, um, Mitch McConnell in the Senate came up with 10 votes. And I'll never forget Chuck Schumer's speech, which was a scathing kick in the groin to Mitch McConnell after that happened. And it created a dynamic where if you if you believed in this not being a crisis and Mitch McConnell doing the right thing, the Democrats were so disdainful of that gesture that it that it you know the toxicity you know went through the roof. And I sort of you know people don't remember that moment. I remember it very well hmm. because Joe Manchin, Senator Manchin, was so pissed off. Excuse my language, folks in media land about 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 what Schumer had done. Is there any? I mean, I want to ask questions, but I mean, I think there's a hangover of that toxicity that makes some of the deals that people think, oh, one side just going to be, you know, more responsible than the other. But I agree entirely with your framing, Ramesh. But at the same time, there's a lot of bad blood between the key players here. But yes, and, and tell us who you are. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Katie Bocherishvili. I'm the former vice minister of economy of Georgia. I want to bring the topic back to Ukraine, Russia. Yes, thank you. Um, again, uh, Russia has occupied Georgia 20%. And also recently, in 2008, we had the armed conflict. And we all remember that by that time, the world has decided not to irritate Russia. So right. we even got the blame that we initiated the war against Russia, which is like 4.5 million uh, population. Right. Um, so it's not only Ukraine's war, it's our war. The Soviet Union did not collapse in 1991. Uh, it is now collapsing. Only two countries who were trying to get out of the influence of mm. Russia was Georgia and Ukraine. And we mm. have been how to say, it's punished very, like, sadly yeah. with, you know, uh, wars, armed conflicts, destroying our economy, like, and going back, again, our aspiration, Georgia has been a reforming country, we've been trying to align our values, you know, reforms to Western countries, but still there is no, how to say, attention, and especially we've talked about NATO, right. joining NATO, right. we've talked about Scandinavian countries, but not Georgia, right. and we are at threat as well. Thank you. Um, so, kind of my so Seth, quite, you know, your, your, your thoughts mm -hmm. on this is a very interesting question. I interviewed Andrei Kortunov recently, who's the director in Moscow of, I think, the Russian International Relations Center. He's sort of the Richard Haas of Russia, made exactly the same point. He says, what we're seeing is the, the collapse of the Soviet Union is actually happening now. This is the ongoing dimension. And it's a very interesting, interesting perspective that I think America doesn't have. But what are your thoughts and reaction about Georgia? I, and I would also say... Crimea about about various other earlier um, foreshocks of the major crisis in Ukraine today. Well, I think the West collectively forgot about Georgia because forgetting about Georgia made it convenient to think that Putin was had what he needed and he would stop. And then we did the so same thing with Crimea. Him. We appeased him. Yeah, we did. Yeah. And then we did the same thing with Crimea. Said, well, he took Crimea, but he'll probably stop they there. Stop there. They will never stop there. And if we don't stop him in Ukraine. I don't want to be at Davos, you know, 2032 saying, you know, well, Poland, you know, right. well, Lithuania, well, Moldova, you know, we thought that would be it and he would stop there. So that's why it's so important that we're in Ukraine and that's why it's so important that the Ukrainians win. And isn't, but the heart of your question, though, isn't Poland technically World War Three then? I mean, probably is. Yeah. Yeah. And I got in a lot of trouble when I said that we're essentially in a proxy war with Russia now. But like, let's be honest, that's, of course, that's exactly what's going on. So the question, though, really, is what does the dissolution of the Soviet Union look like? Or, in, you know, the, the famous words of General Petraeus in the early days of the Iraq War, tell me how this ends. Right. And I think that's a very difficult question. I, and I, I'm not smart enough to answer it. I haven't found anyone who can yet. But we have to figure out a way for this to end that looks like the dissolution of the Soviet Union in the early 90s, which was remarkable, remarkable for its peacefulness. Right. That's the challenge. What, you have a quick answer, Joaquin? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, th I think the world also thought that Putin would be gone by now, that Russia would have replaced him, that there would be a new leader, right? Obviously, that hasn't happened. Medvedev being there for a bit, I think people thought that Putin would be off the stage. We used to think he was the warm and fuzzy guy. Yeah. <laughs> But that's right. Not so warm and fuzzy. I just saw the comment. You're a Japan expert yeah. comment he made about the Japanese prime minister. Uh, so, no, I mean, I agree with Seth on a lot of that. But it was this repeated pattern of Georgia, Crimea, and then Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, you have to stop that. Right. Right. 
Thank you. So Ken Weinstein, former president of the Hudson Institute. First of all, Steve, congratulations mm -hmm. to you and, and your colleagues. Thank on, you. Uh, launch of summit for a must read. Congressman Moulton, a question for you. Thank you for doing my, my, my panel on Thursday on the Indo-Pacific. Are we invited? You are invited. I'll, okay, good. I'll, I'll send you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's almost filled up. Question for you. you, you it's sort of a reverse of the Petraeus question. How, and the, the real question is, how does this begin? You, you said, and I agree 100%, that Ukraine marks a failure of deterrence. Are there things the U.S. government should have done in the lead up to the war that it didn't do, in your opinion? Um, and I, I mean, I mean, are there things we didn't do over years, as we just discussed it with the Georgia question, but in the immediate lead up, are there things that could have deterred Russia, do you think, or was deterrence impossible in this case? Thank you. Well, it's a great question because if you look at, you know, Putin's just <laughs> maniacal commitment to taking over Ukraine, you could certainly make the argument, you can certainly make the argument that he was gonna do this regardless. Nonetheless, I think we missed a lot of opportunities. We have assembled the most remarkable coalition of allies that Europe has ever seen, that the world has really ever seen since World War II, but we did it after the fact. You know, we've got this remarkable coalition of American and Western companies to pull out of, Ukra uh, out of Russia, but we did that right. after the fact. Putin had no idea that that would happen. Putin had no idea that we would be able to get NATO together. That's a failure of deterrence. Right. So you take that to the Pacific, if we think that we're going to be able to work with our allies, we need to show, show China that today, right. not after they invade. If we think we're going to be able to get economic sanctions together, we need to lay out that blueprint and show that we have agreement around the world today, not after they invade China. Then we're, and Dave, we're getting near the end. I want to take Kurt Volker, Jamie Moore, and, and, and this gentleman here, and we'll, we'll just go quickly. I'm sorry that we're running out of time, but yes, we'll, and we'll take them in order. Yeah, Kurt. Steve, Volker. a quick comment, because yeah. I, I can't yeah. let you get off quoting Bill Burns and WikiLeaks. And Got it. Worry about I knew, I knew you were going to, you know, I name-checked you. you got to you know? look up my WikiLeaks from August 2008, where I said, after Putin's invasion of Georgia, we have to take seriously hmm. what he said about Ukraine, that is not a real country. Uh, and so Putin has invaded not because Ukraine was on its way into NATO. I promise in all future mentions I will give you equal time <laughs> okay. for equal WikiLeaks he memos. He didn't invade because Ukraine yeah. was on its way into NATO. Yeah. He invaded because it wasn't uh. on its way into NATO. And I think that's a key lesson here. Thank what, you. Now, I think what I worry about, Congressman, I'd love to hear your comments yeah. on this. I worry that in our domestic politics, the clock is ticking, uh, that we may have a year, a year and a half of strong bipartisan support for Ukraine but right. we are not doing enough to lead and ensure that Ukraine wins the war in that period of time. Right. And do you think we can get to that level? And can you hold that just a minute, Jamie Warren? Yeah, so a uh, very different direction. I wanted to end on. That's okay. He'll go to. Well, we're going to have this gentleman here, so you're the middle. Okay. You're not the end. Okay. Yeah. Um, I wondered to both congressmen, uh, do you, and I'm sorry, former defense official, yeah. now out of the federally funded research and development center. Do you see opportunity areas for big uh, unifying projects or agenda items? Like space. I mean, I work on space. Yeah. I like space. Okay. But you may have others yeah. and that then, we can pull people together. Let's go to this gentleman right here. Thank you. I'm Gerard Muchner from an American healthcare company called Henry Schein. <clears throat> what should be the limit of American military involvement related to Ukraine? Great. Thank you. Oh, uh, I'm going to give Joaquin the floor first. Sure. Uh, well, let me answer the last question. I think supplying Ukraine with weapons. Um, there's been no proposal, for example. I haven't heard any discussion about uh, putting American troops on the ground, for example. Mm. Um, you know, so that's kind of a um, the issue about how long it goes on, right? I, I was curious, in your question, you, you seem to make a comment. I would ask, like, what is your perspective on how much we should be doing? Because we have our debates, but what do you think? Yeah. Long range artillery so they can, hit the can we give him the mic so that sure. the camera can hear? Great. Um, a couple framing things and a couple technical things. Technical, long range artillery that goes beyond 80 kilometers so that they can hit the Russian supply lines further back. This is particularly important for the Kurt Strait Bridge and the naval base at Sevastopol. So, Kurt, are we pulling our we're punches by punch. not letting them do we're that? Not, we're not. We're still not supplying <coughs> tanks. We're not supplying aircraft. Right. Because we're worried about Ukraine going after Russia. We, we have proper. an imaginary line somewhere where we seem to think that if we do X, Putin will view that as an escalation and launch World War III. That's a, that's a, a yeah. misunderstanding. Putin already thinks he's at war with NATO. Mm. He has put this in existential terms himself. Mm. We need to make this as short as possible. 
So we got to give the Ukrainians the equipment they need. They've got right. to isolate Crimea. Right. And we should not accede to Putin denying freedom of navigation in the Black Sea. Mm. This is something the United mm. States has stood for for over 200 years. And we shouldn't allow that. Can, can I comment on this a little yeah. bit? Sort of, yeah, please, uh, go ahead. Strategic level. Um, look, I, I have been quite critical of the Biden administration during the early part of how they handled this war. Mm. And I wrote a, an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal after coming back from Kiev in December of a year and a month ago. Um, that essentially said what I just said to you, Ken, that we haven't done enough for uh, deterrence, right? But I do think that the Biden administration has done a remarkable job since then of walking this line between getting Ukraine what they need but not pushing it over uh, over the edge. That's what right. they're trying to do. Right. Having said that, I take your point that we can probably push a bit further. And I want to make a quick historical analogy to the Cuban Missile Crisis. I made it. I, I slandered John F. Kennedy earlier by saying that he uh, might might not have entirely written his book. Um, let me tell you a moment where where he handled uh, world affairs so brilliantly that we're all safely here today, and we might not have been if this had gone right. gone the other way. He was faced with this unprecedented problem with with Russia shipping um, nuclear weapons to Cuba, and he said, "I want to establish a naval blockade." And his aides came to him and he said, a naval blockade is an act of war. You can't do that, Mr. President. That will start a war with Russia. So what did Kennedy do? He redefined the terms of the debate. He came up with a new word. Someone got out of the source and he came up with the word quarantine. Hmm. Let's be clear. He was basically establishing a naval blockade. But he said, he told the world, this is a quarantine, i.e. I'm allowed to do this. It's not an act of war. And Russia backed down because President Kennedy defined the terms of the debate. We cannot let Putin continue to define the terms of the debate, to tell us what the red lines are and dictate what weapons we're willing to provide because of his red lines, not because of ours. Uh, just finally, 30 seconds each to Jamie Morin's question. Are there big national, international projects you know, like space, like other things that basically, you know, hopefully take us into, I mean, we're in Davos, big ideas. Do you yeah. have big ideas to share in Davos on how the world can get, you know, happier? Well, a few things. First, the last time we had a major immigration reform bill was when you had a divided Congress. Right. 2013, 2014. So that gives me some hope, right? Not that it'll necessarily happen. But uh, also, we need to start taking a look at, 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 Regulation, and this may not make everybody happy, but regulation in nascent industries uh, like crypto, for example, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we just saw this big bubble burst. I, I think there's, in terms of, you ask the question, where is there bipartisan support that's not necessarily along ideological lines, hard ideological lines to right. take a look at things? That's certainly one of them, along with other nascent industries. Um, so those are two. Right. Perhaps here's, here's, something like criminal justice reform. Mm -hmm. Seth? Fusion. Fusion. Fusion will change the world. And there are a lot of companies, including in Massachusetts, that are competing. The European Union has a big effort. Um, but this is a place where the world can come together. It will change the world. It will do more to solve climate change than any other technology out there. My bet, Davos 2023, to anyone who wants to take this bet, is that 50 years from now, maybe even sooner than that, we're going to be tearing down windmills left and right because it's such an unbelievably right. inefficient way to make power. And we're going to have fusion, which is carbon-free and safe. And that will change the world. But how quickly we get there says a lot about where the planet will be in 10 or 20 years. So before we thank these gentlemen, let me just uh, share that Semaphore will be hosting in this room uh, tomorrow. Uh, our lineup is the, I, I call her the, the, the space minister of the UAE. So the, so the woman who is the minister of both public education and science, but also the space agency in UAE will join Fran Katsudis of Cisco Systems. Uh, and tomorrow, Alexander Soros. George Soros is not speaking this year, so I said, let's invite Alex Soros, the next generation of Soros, to get their view. And then, um, I have not told this to Ben Smith, my great colleague, our editor-in-chief here, but on Thursday morning, he is going to be here interviewing Chris Cox of Meta, who I think is the number two, right? He's the, he's the, he has the, you know, in, he's the power behind the throne. Um, that right after he's done with that, we probably will have Jose Andres joining us and talking about it. Oh, wow. That has not yet been announced. So, <laughs> so Thursday we'll have you. So thank you very much, Seth thank Moulton. You. Thank you very much, thank Joaquin Castro. Two great congressmen. Thank you very much for joining us today. Okay. Thank you.